Stuka Joe here. Today we will be taking a look at this game, Bonaparte's Eastern Empire. This is a game designed by Andrew Rourke and published in 2024 by Form Square Games. That's Andrew Rourke's brand new wargaming company. And this is their first publication and the first in what will be the series of games in the Limits of Glory system. Now this particular game is about Napoleon Bonaparte's Egyptian expedition that lasted from 1798 to 1801. It's a two-player game. One player takes control of the French forces and the other player of the Allied forces. And when we say Allied, of course, we have the British, the Ottomans, and the Mamluks. But keep an eye on the Mamluks because they may switch sides. This is a game that uses the limits of glory system. We will be taking a look at how that works. So we will be setting up the game, discussing the victory conditions, and then we will play through each of the three phases of the game. That is the invasion phase, the disembarkation phase, and the conquest phase. So let's go to the table and take a look at Bonaparte's Eastern Empire. We have the game partially set up. We will complete the setup. But let's explain some of the features of the game. The map is an area map. In each area, be it a sea area or a land area, has a number from one to four. And that is the number that is tied to this limits of glory system. In this game, nothing is automatic. If a player wishes to move troops that are in a particular space, that space has to be activated first. And for a space to be activated, the player rolls a number of dice equal to the number that appears in the space. And if he obtains at least a five or a six with any of the dice, that space is successfully activated. So for example, if the allied player wished to activate Giza that has a value of three, he would roll three dice. And in this particular case, one six was rolled so that space would be activated. However, if he rolls like this, two threes and a one, there is no five or a six, so that space is not activated. And what happens then? Then the allied player has to spend three of the commander's glory points in order to re-roll three dice once again. So you see, each commander in the game will have a number of glory points and you will keep track of them in this numbers track. And you also keep track of victory points here. Now, a word about the map. Here you see in the bottom left-hand corner of the map, there are eight areas in a rectangle. This is Upper Egypt. This is really an inset because these areas are not really there. They are not adjacent to this number one area. Upper Egypt, in reality, is closer to Cairo and Giza, as you see here. And we will be using this copy that I made to give you an idea of how far the French have to march to reach Luxor and also the Valley of the Kings. And why is the Valley of the Kings so important? It's because the French have to escort this Savant's marker and drop it here in the Valley of the Kings. By doing so, they gain five victory points. The game begins with the invasion phase. The French have three fleet markers. However, there's only one invasion fleet. The other two are dummies. The game includes these three tiles. At the beginning of the game, the French player secretly selects one of the tiles and places it face down in front of him. That is the tile that will identify the real French fleet. The Allies have one fleet under Nelson, whose task is to intercept the real French fleet. The real French fleet is looking to disembark somewhere in Egypt. And there are various eligible spaces where the fleet can disembark. It can disembark in any coastal space, it cannot disembark directly into Alexandria, and it has to disembark in Egypt. So it cannot disembark in Syria. There are 
spaces that are more advantageous than others. This number two space that you see here has a central position on the board. From this space, the French can send a force in a northeast direction to conquer Syria and in a southwest direction to conquer Egypt. So the French most likely will try to have their real French fleet reach there. If the fleet is intercepted, the uh, number of strength points that Bonaparte will have will be less than if it's not intercepted. And the fleet will start in this number two space here off Marabout Bay. Let's talk about the victory conditions. There are instant victory conditions and regular victory conditions. For the French player to win an instant victory, at the end of any turn, he must have control of all victory point built up areas in the game. Built up areas are those that have a picture of a structure and the victory point ones are the ones that have a banner. There are six of these victory point built up areas in Egypt and three in Syria. So it's a total of nine. So as you can see, it is a tough proposition to control all nine at the end of a particular turn. But if the French do so, they instantly win at the end of the turn. Now the allied player can also win an instant victory if at the end of any turn, British and or Ottoman forces control Cairo and Alexandria. But you see at the beginning of the game, it is the Mamluks who are in control of Egypt. So the French will be battling the Mamluks at the beginning of the game. They are allied to the British and the Ottomans, but the Mamluks can also change sides. So they're practically in the way of both sides. So we talked about instant victory conditions. If none of these occur, then when a die roll occurs that triggers the peace of Amiens, the game ends immediately and we count the victory points. And the side that has the most victory points wins. We're about to begin the game. We have to determine the glory points for each of the commanders that begin in play. Admiral Bruet is the commander of the French fleet. And as stated before, the real French fleet is one of those three markers. And we won't place this marker with the real French fleet because we will give it away. But we have to determine how many glory points he has. And his formula is five plus the result of 3d6. We roll the dice, eight plus five, 13. We place his marker in the 13 space of the number strike. On the Allied side, Nelson is the Admiral, the Commander, so we have to roll for his glory. For that, we roll 2d6, and the result is a 4. It's going to be pretty tough for Nelson to do anything with 4 glory points. We have to determine the glory for Murad and Ibrahim, which are the two Mamluk leaders. We roll 4d6 for Murad, and that is 11. And now we roll 3d6 for Ibrahim and we add 3. And that is 12. But those are pretty low rolls for the two Mamluk leaders. And finally, we have Jesar Pasha, who is the Ottoman leader in Acre. So for him, we roll 4 dice and we add Eight. And the result is 13 plus 8, 21. And to complete setup, we have to place these eight Bedouin markers. Actually, the Allied player places them, but he has certain discretion. We have to roll eight dice, and the number on the die result will tell us where they will be placed. There's no one, so none will be placed in a one area. There are three twos, two threes, one four, one five, and a six. So the twos, threes, and fours will be placed in areas that have that number. And the five and six means that two of the counters can be placed in any space. These Bedouin markers, what they do is that they uh, deduct one 
glory point from a French commander that is in a space with them. So starting with the number two Bedouins, the Allied player places one Bedouin marker in three number two spaces. And one is placed here off Marbut Bay, which is the landing area if the French fleet is intercepted. Second Bedouin marker is placed here in this area, which is that number two uh, landing area, which is very attractive for the French for its central position. And the third number two Bedouin will go in this space here in Upper Egypt. Now the Allied player places the two number three Bedouins. And one is placed here in Alexandria, a victory point built up area. And the second one is placed here in Salalie, which is a built up area, which is between that attractive landing area and other victory point uh, areas in Egypt. Now comes the four Bedouin. There's only two four spaces on the map, Ramaniya and Cairo, which is a victory point built up area. So in Cairo it is. And the two last Bedouin markers are a five and a six, so they can be placed in any area. And one will be placed here in Upper Egypt to force the player to go through Bedouins to get to the Valley of the Kings. The last Bedouin will be placed here in Damanhur, which is a built up area between Alexandria and Rosetta. Now to finish with the setup, we place the Allied Victory Point Marker in the number 25 space, and that takes into account all Victory Point built-up areas that the Allies control at the beginning of the game. The French start with no Victory Point, so we place their marker right off the track. So we start the invasion phase. There's three French fleet markers, but only one is the real French fleet. The identity of that fleet is in that face down tile that you see there that only the French player knows what it is. The French player has three momentum pawns, one for each fleet. And when all three are placed on the board, the French turn ends and then it's the Allied player's turn. So the French will begin by attempting to activate the sea area there where the Toulon fleet is. He needs fives or sixes. He rolls four D6. And there's a five and a six, so that is successful. And that fleet moves into the number two space. The French will attempt to activate that fleet again. Now they roll 2d6 and they need a five or a six. And that's a double one. And that's a failure. If the French want that fleet to move, they have to spend glory points to reroll dice, up to two dice. So Bruet will spend two glory points. He has 11 left. And notice that, that could be the dummy fleet, but in any event, you can spend uh, Bruet's glory points to move the dummy fleet. So now two D6 are rolled, looking for a five or a six, and that's a failure. And that's the end of the turn for that fleet. So we place a momentum marker right next to the fleet there. Now the French will attempt to move the Genoa fleet. We roll 4d6, and the result is a 6, so that's a success. And it moves into that number one space. That number one space is hard to get out of, but it's also hard for the Allied player to intercept because he would also roll one die and need a 5 or a 6. So now that fleet does not have to continue to move now. We can switch to another fleet and maybe try later to move that fleet, and that's what we will do. The French will not try to move the Civita Vecchia fleet. It's in a four space, we roll 4d6, and there is a five. So that's also a success. And it moves to the number two space north of Malta. Now we will continue to try to move the Civita Vecchia fleet, we roll 2d6, and a double one, that is a failure. And Bruet will spend two glory points to re-roll for that fleet. We roll 2d6, five or six, and five and a six. So that is a success. And that fleet enters the Malta space. A 
fleet that enters the Malta space, fake or real, has to stop there. And we place a visited Malta marker on the fleet. We also place a momentum marker next to the fleet. Now, if that's the real French fleet and it gets to disembark in Egypt, it will provide to the French certain benefits that we will see later. The French still have one fleet that hasn't uh, been uh, affected by a momentum marker. It's in a one space, so it will attempt to move. So we roll 1d6 and we need, needing a 5 or a 6, and that's a failure. And Bruet will burn one glory point. We re-roll 1d6, and that's a fail. So that's the end of that fleet's turn. We place the third French momentum marker. Now it's the Allied player's turn. And the last thing that the Allies want is for that uh, Chivitavecchia fleet to be the real fleet and disembark in that uh, centrally located coastal space that you see there with the Bedouin. So Nelson will try to reach that fleet, but he wants to avoid also that number one space. Nelson only has four glory points. So we start by trying to activate Nelson. We roll 3d6 and the Brits need a five or a six. And that's a failure. So the question is, does he spend any glory points now or saves them for later? He will save them for the next turn. So we place a momentum marker in Nelson's space. And this turn is over, so now we remove all the momentum markers. Now the French player has his turn and he has three momentum markers. He will try first with the Malta fleet to activate that fleet. It's in a number two space, so he rolls two d6. And it's a double four, so that's a miss. And Bruet will spend two glory points, and he has six left. We re-roll for the fleet in Malta, and it fails. It is stuck there with a momentum marker, so the French now attempt to move that fleet there in the number one space, the Genoa fleet, only 1d6. Lowell is a four, so that is a failure. And Bruet spends one glory point. Five left. And we roll again, 1d6, and another failure. So that fleet is stuck there. Now it's the Toulon fleet turn. Now, if this is a real French fleet, it could opt to move into that number three space with Nelson there, but Nelson would have a chance to intercept within the space, and he would roll three dice, and just a five or a six would do the trick, and that is very dangerous. So, that Toulon fleet will try to move. We roll two d6, five or a six, and that also fails. So the French have to decide if they're going to burn in glory points with that particular fleet. They decide they won't burn any glory points. That is the end of the French turn. And now it's the Allied player's turn. They will try to activate Nelson, that number three space. They need fives or sixes, at least one. And they got a five and a six. So that is a success. Nelson moves up north. He will try to intercept that Toulon fleet, now he would have to roll two dice, that's the number in the space, and obtain a five or a six. And he has four glory points left. Roll 2d6, and yes, a five. So, interception is successful. Now, depending on whether that's the real French fleet or not, is what happens next. If it's a dummy, it is removed. And if it is a real French fleet, it will disembark, but with less resources and strength points at Marabout Bay. Let's see if it's the real French fleet. Here we see the two tiles that were not selected by the French player. 
and one of them is the Toulon fleet. So that is a dummy. And because it is a dummy, we remove the fleet from play. But the Allied player has not concluded his turn. He can still try to activate Nelson's fleet. Nelson is in a two space, so he will try to move into that number one space and intercept the fleet there. So he rolls two d6. And no luck. Now Nelson will spend two of his glory points. He has two left. And he re-rolls. It's a five or a six, and that is a failure. And that ends his turn right there. So now we begin a new turn. We remove the momentum pawns. French have four glory points. Nelson only two. And the French start They're attempting to activate the fleet that is in Malta. So we roll 2d6 and there's two fives. So that is a success and that fleet moves to that number two space there. And it will try to continue along and reach that vaunted two coastal space there that you see with the Bedouin. Now it rolls 2d6 and the roll is a three and a one. That is a failure. And Bruay decides to spend two glory points and has three left. And we roll 2d6 again for the French fleet and there is a six. So that is a success. Now the fleet is approaching that coastal area. If it advances into that number two space to the south, it will get there. So now we roll 2d6. And the roll is a four and a one, a failure. Now Bruet will spend two of his three glory points. Here comes the re-roll. And there's two fives. So that is a success. And as you can see, that fleet is in a C space adjacent to that uh, two space. So the French player declares that he will move that fleet no longer and we place a momentum marker on the fleet. Now that fleet that just moved may be a dummy. The Allied player doesn't know, so the French still can try to move that Genoa fleet and they will attempt to do so, but it's only in, an, in a one space. So they roll 1d6, they need a five or a six, that's a failure. And with one glory point left for Bruet, the French will not burn it at this time. So the French place their momentum pawn on that fleet. And now it is the Allied player's turn. Nelson is in a two space, so he will attempt to activate. He has only two glory points left. And there is a five, so that is a success. Now Nelson is in the same space as the fleet there, the Genoa fleet. Nelson still has to roll for interception, be successful, and it's only one die. So, uh, Allied player rolls 1d6, and the result is a five, and that's an interception. So Nelson intercepts the Genoa fleet. Is that the real fleet or a dummy? Well, it happens that the tile, the second tile that was discarded and not chosen as the real fleet, was the Genoa fleet, so that is a dummy. And because it is a dummy fleet, we remove the marker and the momentum pawn. So it's not a secret anymore. The real fleet is the one that is off Damietta. And Nelson is a long way from that fleet, but his turn hasn't ended yet, and he has two glory points. So Nelson will attempt to approach that fleet from the northwest through those number two sea areas there. But he has to get off that number one sea area first. So we roll 1d6 and a five. And that is successful. So Nelson moves. And now he's in a number two area. And we roll 2d6 
and this time it is a failure. And Nelson will spend the last two glory points that he has. Oh, here we go, 2d6, and that is two and two, that is a failure. And that ends Nelson's turn and the Allied player's turn. We remove the momentum pawns, we go to the next turn, but the French player declares that the Civitavecchia fleet is the real French fleet and it will be landing. It will be landing in that number two space that you see there with the Bedouin marker. It cannot land in Damietta because that is a built up area space. But with that, the invasion phase is over. Now we go to the disembarkation phase. And the French invasion fleet will disembark in the number two space occupied by the Bedouin marker. We consult the disembarkation table, which is in pages 20 and 20 of the rulebook. It has four columns, one for the invasion fleet situation, the next one actions to be taken. The last two columns have to do with effects, whether the French fleet did not visit Malta or the effects that apply if the French fleet visited Malta, which was the case here. The three invasion fleet statuses are intercepted at sea, intercepted while disembarking in Egypt, and none of these occurred in the game, and disembarks in Egypt without being intercepted, which is the one that applies here. And we start by replacing the French invasion fleet with Brueys, Villeneuve, and Duchaila's on-map position markers, and we remove any remaining dummy fleets. There's no dummy fleets, but we remove the Civitavecchia fleet marker. Place Brueys, Villeneuve, and Duchaila's fleet mark. Now we add hoods and trowbridge on map position markers to the sea space that has a Nelson mark. Nelson is off the coast of Malta, so we add hood and trowbridge's fleet markers there. And now we calculate each new naval commander's glory rating and we mark it on the numbers track and we add four d6s in glory points to Nelson's glory score. We see that Nelson has zero left so we roll four d6 and the roll is 17. We place his marker in the 17 space. Let's roll for the new British naval commanders, Trowbridge and Hood. Trowbridge, we roll 2d6, and the roll is a 4. For Hood, it is 2d6, and we add 7. 3 plus 7 is 10. Now we roll for the two new French naval commanders, Duchaila and Villeneuve. We roll 2d6 for Duchaila. The roll is an 11. And for Villeneuve, it's 2d6 plus 4. The roll is a 5 plus 4, 9. Now we consult the French fleet having visited Malta column and we cross-reference it with the row or disembarking in Egypt without being intercepted. We start by following the topmost instruction, Bonaparte's on map position marker, accompanied by 26 infantry, one artillery and the savants element is placed on an adjacent coastline land space of the French player's choice. We take Bonaparte's on map marker and we place it in an adjacent land space. And note that we are using that disk beneath it to denote that there are attached elements to Napoleon's marker there. And those accompanying elements are placed here in this box. 
There's 26 infantry strength points, one artillery strength point, and the savants. Note also that accompanying Bonaparte are all these commanders that you see here. I will just not place them in the elements box to keep things organized, but all of those infantry and cavalry commanders are with Napoleon Bonaparte with his army that just disembarked. Next, Bonaparte's glory marker is placed on the number track in the space resulting from the roll of 4d6 plus 46. Notice that that is the formula to compute his glory points because the French fleet was not intercepted at sea and the French visited Malta. If the French would have been intercepted at sea, his formula would have been 4d6 plus 42. And notice that the French would have 19 infantry strength points. But they were not intercepted and they visited Malta, so they have uh, 26 infantry strength points. So now it's time to roll to see how many glory points Napoleon has. Notice that the numbers track only reaches 50. So if Napoleon obtains a score higher than 50, the excess glory points will be marked with that automatic six marker. What that does is when the French want to re-roll a die, they just burn one of those automatic six points and they don't even have to roll. It's an automatic success. So we roll 4d6 to determine Bonaparte's glory. The roll is a 13 plus 46 is 59. So Bonaparte's glory marker goes to the 50 space and the automatic six marker is placed in the nine space. French visited Malta. Now the Malta garrison is placed on the Malta space and we increase the French victory point score by two victory points. And to place a French garrison in Malta, we have to subtract one infantry strength point from Bonaparte's army. So it now has 25 infantry strength points. And we place French garrison marker at Malta. And that gives the French player two victory points. And finally, the French player can designate a Malta governor. And the French designate Briant as Malta governor. His marker is placed there. And because Friant was placed on the board, we have to determine his glory points. And we roll for d6. And the roll is 11 his marker here in the 11 space. Now because Bonaparte's army entered a space with a Bedouin marker, now the Bedouin effect takes place. In this game the Bedouins only affect the French. The allied player rolls a number of dice equal to the space value, in this case two, and each success reduces the glory of the most senior present French commander. That's going to be Bonaparte and it reduces it by one. So, 2d6 are rolled, and there's a 5. That's one success. And a downside is that with the Bedouin effects, there is no opportunity for a reroll. So, Bonaparte's glory is reduced by 1 to 49. And that concludes the disembarkation phase. And now we move on to the conquest phase. Now, normally, in each turn of the conquest phase, we start with the event clock, and we would roll one or more dice to determine a specific event. But in the first turn of the conquest phase, this is skipped. Now we determine who has the initiative, who goes first, and how many momentum markers each side has. We roll 4d6, looking for successes on the French side, two, and on the Allied side, only one. So the side whose most senior commander currently has the least glory decides if they wish to re-roll any dice first. 
Most senior commander on the Allied side is Nelson with 17 glory points. And on the French side, it is Bonaparte with 49. So the Allies will reroll three of the four dice. The French have to decide if they will reroll any dice, and they will not reroll any dice, so they don't spend any glory points. But we have to discount three from Nelson's. So Nelson's glory goes down to 14. And we reroll three dice, and no luck for the Allies. So they're stuck with just one momentum marker. So the French go first because they have more momentum markers than the Allies. The French will activate or try to activate uh, Bonaparte's army in that number two space. So we roll 2d6 and they're oh, five and six. Space is activated. And the French decide to put Kleba into action so he will be commanding a French force and we have to determine his glory points which is 14 plus 4d6 so the die result is 13 plus 14 is 27 we place Claver's second marker in the 27 space on the numbers track and from Bonaparte's original force Claver will be commanding 11 strength points so Claver's force is in the space, and he has uh, 11 infantry strength points. Now the French can move both forces. Claver will be moving in the direction of Syria, and Bonaparte in the direction of Cairo. Claver moves into El Arish, and there will be combat in that area. Bonaparte moves into Salalier and the Bedouin effect will now take place. And let's resolve that right now. Roll 3d6 and a 5 and a 6. So Bonaparte loses two glory points. And he now has 47. Now we resolve the combat. El Arish. We have to determine the combat value for each of the sides. Notice that infantry is worth one, cavalry two, and artillery three. Built up areas are only considered during sieges. Labor has 11 infantry strength points. The Ottomans have a force without a commander with four infantry strength points. So we locate the strengths of each of the sides here in the combat results table. The French use the 11 to 15 column in the first row, which pertains to French units with or without a commander. And the Mamluks, they use the bottom row, which is for no allied commander, and they use the 4 to 10 column. French need to roll a 10 or higher to cause any hits, and if they do so, then any 6 rolled off the 6 hits, and any 5 four hits. The Mamluks, on the other hand, they have to roll 18 or more, and all combats are resolved by rolling four dice. And they score only one hit if they roll a six, no hits if they roll a five. So we roll 4d6 for each of the sides. The French rolled the minimum necessary 10, but notice no fives or sixes, no hits. The Allies they rolled 11, not enough to reach the 18 threshold, so they don't inflict any hits either. Here we see the die results, and the active player has to decide if he will re-roll any dice. French will re-roll three dice. Bonaparte's glory is down to 44. The allies can't re-roll any of their dice because they don't have a commander in this battle. So we roll the three French dice, looking for fives and sixes. Ooh, two sixes. Well, the final score for the French is over that 10 threshold. And we have two sixes. That is a total of 12 hits. So 12 hits, of course, more than enough to wipe out the Ottoman force. And the French score one victory point for El Arish. 
So their total for now is three. With the capture of El Arish, the Ottomans lose the number of victory points indicated in the banner too. The Allied score goes down to 23. Now the French continue with the turn until they are forced to place a momentum mark. And the French want to activate Kleber in order to move into Jaffa. And for that, we roll 2d6. And there's a 6. So it is a success. Kleber moves into Jaffa, but he needs to leave a garrison at El Arish. And that is one infantry strength point. And Kleber has 10 left. Now we resolve the battle at Jaffa. Labor has a combat value of 10, and the Ottomans, 6. So we locate the spaces in the combat results table. We see that the French need to roll 13, and the Ottomans again have to roll 18 with 46. And the French roll a total of 21, while the Ottomans roll 15. Now the French have to decide if they will re-roll any of their dice. They won't. The Ottomans can't re-roll because they don't have a commander. The French won't force the Allies to re-roll any of their dice because the Allies did not reach the threshold of 18. They fell short at 15. So that's the end of the combat. French cause 11 hits. And that, of course, is more than enough to wipe out the Ottoman force. French have conquered Jaffa. That is one more victory point. French now have four. With the capture of Jaffa, the Ottomans lose two victory points. Reducing the Allied score now to 21. French continue with their turn, but they will not be moving Kleber at this time. Instead, they will try to activate Bonaparte's Force, which is at Salalia, in order to move to Belbeis. So we roll 3d6, and there's a 6. That is a successful move. Now Bonaparte is between Suez and Cairo. French will attempt to activate the Belbeis area. We roll 3d6, and that is a failure. Well, now the French have to make a decision. Do they use glory points to re-roll the dice with no guarantee of success or use one of Bonaparte's automatic six points? Not wanting to take any chances in the French wanting to liquidate as many Mameluk forces as they can before the British arrive, they will spend another of the auto six points. And Bell Base is activated, and Bonaparte will assign another of his division commanders to march into Suez. And that will be Dessé. So we have to determine his glory 19 plus 4d6. And the dice result is 10 plus 19 is 29. Place his marker in the numbers track. Bonaparte has 14 infantry strength points. Dessay will have to conquer Suez with five. He places marker in Belbeis and Dessay moves into Suez. And Bonaparte continues into Cairo. And we'll resolve the Suez battle first. Dessay has a total of five infantry strength points. That's a combat value of five. The Mamluks have one cavalry strength point, which is worth two plus four for the infantry is six. So we locate both spaces. Again, the French need to roll a 13 with four dice. The Mamluks have another uh, force without a commander. They need to roll 18 or more. Now we roll 46 for each of the sides. 15 for the French, and for the Mamluks, only a 10. So the French score seven hits. The Mamluks score no hits. The Mamluk force is eliminated. And the French have captured Suez, and with it, two victory points. 
And the French victory point score is now at six. With the capture of Suez, the Ottomans lose two victory points. The Allied score is down to 19. Now we resolve the battle at Cairo, but before we have to determine if the Bedouins had any effect. In this case, there's four dice to be rolled and one success. So Bonaparte's glory is now 43. Now we have a battle with two commanders, Bonaparte and Ibrahim. Bonaparte has nine infantry strength points and one artillery strength point. Each artillery strength point is worth a combat value of three. So that is a total combat value of 12. On the Mamluk side, Ibrahim has two cavalry strength points. That's a combat value of four plus eight infantry strength points is also 12. So we locate the relevant boxes in the combat results table. The French need to roll 10 or higher to cause losses. The Mamluks 17 or higher. The French rolled a 13, but no, no fives or sixes, so no hits. And the Mamluks rolled an 11, so they didn't even reach the 17 point threshold. Now the French player, who's the active player, has to decide whether he will spend glory points to re-roll any of his dice. And the French will keep a four and re-roll three. Now the Mamluks have to decide, because they have a commander, if they will re-roll any dice. And they will roll all four again. Bonaparte's glory is now at 40. Ibrahim, who has 12, goes down to 8. So we re-roll the French dice first. And there's two sixes and a three. The French are well over the threshold. And enough hits cause serious damage on the Mamluk force. Now the Mamluks roll 4d6. And total score of 13. They don't even reach the threshold. Now the French decide, of course, they will not be forcing the Mamluks to reroll any of their dice because the Mamluks didn't even meet the 17 threshold. They fell short at 13. The Mamluks, however, can spend glory points to force the French to roll those two sixes. And they will do so. Ibrahim spends two glory points and he has six left. And he's fighting for his life here. And the roll is a six and a five. Six and a five produce ten hits. That's exactly the strength of Ibrahim's force. And that wipes out Ibrahim's force entirely. And we remove his marker from the board. The French score six victory points for the capture of Cairo. That increases their victory point score to 12. For the allied player, it represents a loss of eight victory points. The Allied score goes from 19 all the way down to 11. So the French continue with the turn and they have to decide whether to move Desaix's force or Bonaparte's force. Bonaparte has with him the savants and the savants give the French six victory points. If the French can deliver the savants to this Valley of the Kings area, which is in Upper Egypt. There's a sizable Mamluk army at Giza under the command of Murad. And he has seven cavalry and 18 infantry strength points. So Napoleon will attempt to defeat Murad and then move into Upper Egypt. So we have to activate his space first. We roll 4d6 and 
We have two fives and a six, so no problem there. And he enters Giza and he leaves one strength point at Cairo as a garrison. So now he has eight infantry strength points and an artillery strength point. Each infantry is worth one combat value, but each artillery point is worth three. So Bonaparte has a combat value of 11. Murad has seven cavalry. That's combat value of uh, 14 plus 18 infantry. That's a total combat value of 32. And here we see the spaces in the combat result table. The French have to roll a 13 to score hits. And the Mamluks also have to roll a 13. But note that French sixes will cause four hits, while Mamluk sixes will cause only two hits. Bonaparte has 42 glory points left, and he doesn't want to keep on spending glory points for rerolls. And this looks like a situation where rerolls will be definitely needed. So the French designate Dumas, who is a division commander, that is a junior commander, he will be leading the battle. And of course, when a junior commander leads a battle, the uh, player can use his glory points, but the downside is that he risks becoming a casualty. And we have to determine how many glory points Dumas has. It's two plus the roll of three D6, the dice roll is pretty good, 14 plus 2, 16. Replace Dumas marker in the 16 space on the numbers track. Now we roll 4d6 for each of the sides. And the French roll 19, so they're over the threshold. On the other hand, the Mamluks rolled just 12, so they fall short. Now the French have to decide, because they're the active side, if they will re-roll any dice. They decide to re-roll one die, and the Mamluks decide to re-roll three dice. So we reduce the junior commander that's commanding this battle, Dumas's glory to 15. And Murad, who is the Mamluk commander's glory, goes down to eight. We re-roll the French die. The result is a six. So that re-roll was well worth it. Now we re-roll the three Mamluk dice and six, a five, and a four. Not bad at all. So now the French player decides if he will burn any glory from the junior commander Dumas to have the Mamluks re-roll any dice. The French will force the Mamluks to roll again three dice. And Dumas's glory is reduced to 12. Now the Allies have to decide if they will force the French to re-roll any dice. Murad has a total glory of eight right now. And Murad will burn three glory points to have the French re-roll three dice. And Murad's glory now reduced to five. So we re-roll the three French dice and two and two ones. That was really bad for the French. And now we re-roll three Mamluk dice. Five, four, and two. So, at the end of the battle, we only have, with the French, a total score of nine. Doesn't meet the threshold. The Mamluks have a total of 15, so they met their threshold. And they have a five, which scores just one hit on the French, but that's enough to win the battle and cause the French to retreat. So the French lose a strength point. They decide to lose one of their infantry strength points. 
Bonaparte's army has to break off, that is, retreat. And it retreats back to Cairo. Now we have to test if Dumas becomes a casualty. And we roll a number of dice equal to the space where the battle took place. And for him to survive, he needs at least one, five, or six. So we roll 3d6. So Dumas becomes a casualty. And we remove his markers from the game. And because the French lost the combat, we place a momentum marker in the space where the French elements were placed after retreating. Now it's the Allies' turn. They have one momentum marker and they have a couple of moves that they can consider, like sailing the British fleet all the way to uh, the area there off Damiette and try to sink the French fleets gathered there. And also the Allies should consider marching Jezar Pasha's army from Acre, a pretty sizable force with 12 cavalry and 16 infantry strength points. And that army could march into Jaffa and uh, push back Kleber and maybe even recover Jaffa and El Arish for the Allies. The Allies will start by attempting to activate that number 2C area to move those English fleet markers. So we roll 2D6 and a 6 is rolled, so it's a success. The fleets move to that other number 2 space. So they are two areas away from the French fleet. Now the Allies turn their attention to Jezar Pasha's army, currently at Acre, and they will try to activate that space. We roll 3d6, and there's a 5, so it's a success. And the army initiates its advance on Jaffa. Now the Allies attempt to activate the British fleets with Nelson. We roll 2d6, and oh no, fives nor any sixes. So that's a fail. And if Nelson doesn't spend glory points to reroll, the allied turn will be over and we will have to place a momentum marker in that C area. So Nelson spends two glory points for the reroll. And if the British do not succeed in activating this area, the Allied turn will be over. We roll 2d6, and it's a failure. And the sole Allied momentum marker is placed in the sea area with the British fleets. So that means there's no more movement by the British fleets, nor Jezar Pashar's army. Now it's the French player's turn. Notice they cannot activate Bonaparte's army, which is at Cairo. They will attempt to activate Desai's force at Suez. They will have to leave a garrison there in order to join forces with Kleber at Jaffa. For that, they have to roll three dice. And there's two fives. That's a success. Kleber has nine infantry strength points. He leaves one strength point in Suez and moves to Bell Base. And now we will try to activate that space to have uh, Desai continue his move, and it's a success. Now he moves into Salalier. There's a Bedouin marker. So now we roll 3d6 to see if there's any Bedouin effect, and Desai loses any glory, and there's a 5. So Desai loses one glory point. And he has 28 left. Now, Bedouin effects, successful or not, do not have any effect on momentum. So, Desai can continue to move. And this time, 3d6 are rolled to see if he can uh, succeed in being activated. Now, that's a failure. And Desai will spend three glory points to reroll. 
So we roll 3d6 to see if this is activated and he fails. So we place the second French momentum marker on the board and that's the last momentum marker for this turn. And with that, the turn ends. So now we remove all momentum markers from the board. And now we proceed to the next turn. And at the beginning of each turn, the first thing we do is we roll for an event. Here we see the event table in the game. It's called the event clock. And as you can see, it is pretty dynamic. At the beginning of the game, we place this marker here in order to denote that we only roll one die to determine which event will apply. And that will result in a result from one to six, but eventually the result will call us to re-roll uh, the dice and add one additional marker. If that happens, then we will be rolling two dice, and then the results will be in a lower area of the table and so forth as the game progresses and enters its late stages we will be finding more likely results on this bottom part and uh, you have results that are more akin to the stages of the campaign when they happen but at this particular juncture we only have to roll one die and locate the applicable event and the roll is a six and the event is that we place Mustafa Pasha. 12 Ottoman infantry, 11 Ottoman cavalry, and one naval squadron at Rhodes. We locate Mustafa Pasha's markers. And we place 11 cavalry with the accompanying elements. And 12 infantry. And there's a fleet marker that we place in Rhodes together with Mustafa Pasha's marker in that safe sea zone for the Allied player denoted by the red anchor. And that red anchor means that the French player cannot enter that sea zone. And we have to determine how many glory points Mustafa Pasha has. We roll 3d6. And the roll is a 16. Now that event that just occurred is a non-recurring event, non-repeating. When you compare it to the 4R event, the R means that it can repeat itself during the game. And because this is a non-repeatable event, there is a second tile in the game with the same event number that we just place on the space to denote that on a future die roll of six, this other event will take place. Next, the players determine who has the initiative and how many momentum markers they have. This is where this demo video ends. Bonaparte's Eastern Empire, a game designed by Andrew Rourke and published by Form Square Games. And this is volume one in Form Square Games' Limits of Glory series. As you can see, this is a Napoleonic game that uses a push your luck mechanic in a two player setting. So this is something new that I hadn't seen before. And of course, it's not a military simulation by any means, but it's a very engaging game with little downtime for each of the players and lots of replayability because your commanders will never have the same number of glory points and it is always uncertain if you will be able to activate a force or not. So I hope that this video has given you a good idea of the flow of the game and what the game has to offer. This is Stuka Joe signing off for now. Thanks for watching.